It's the biggest. You ever had a big party? This is the biggest party in the world. Wildest. <laughs> Sexiest. And right now, I can trade any of these beats for like practically anything. Beer, food, kisses if I wanted, hugs, I mean anything. And dirtiest party in the world. <laughs> and no one can do it better than the people of New Orleans. This is Mardi Gras. Every year, more than a million people descend on the city of New Orleans. The streets fill with a sea of revelers, people from all walks of life who flock here to be part of the rituals, the traditions, and the community pride that is Mardi Gras. Happy Mardi Gras! If you can imagine New Orleans as a beautiful queen, and she's got this fantastic, this wonderful tiara on her. The biggest single stone in that tiara is Mardi Gras, the most glamorous and the one that says, hey, come and visit me, and that's it. Happy Mardi Gras! Mardi Gras, described as a snake with a thousand heads, its traditions date back to ancient spring fertility rituals that celebrated the laws of nature, life, and rebirth. Over the centuries, the Catholic Church transformed the pagan celebration into a pre-Easter festival. They made it an acceptable time to indulge in the sins of the flesh before the fasting and penitence of Lent on Ash Wednesday. The season was known as Carnival, and the final most festive 12 days became known as Mardi Gras, French for Fat Tuesday. Mardi Gras is not just a time of year. Carnival is... Twelfth night, it has to do with Catholicism on January 6th. The carnival season starts and goes all the way through to Mardi Gras Day. The celebration of Mardi Gras came to Louisiana with the French explorers more than 300 years ago. Its traditions became the center of New Orleans culture, especially the private social clubs known as crews. They each staged their own parade with floats topped by costumed and masked riders. Today, Mardi Gras in New Orleans is the biggest public celebration in the world. Who can top 12 days, 49 parades, 30,000 costume riders, and more than 100 million beaded necklaces? And when the excitement crescendos on Lune de Gras and Mardi Gras, the final two days of the season, there are more than a million people on the streets. How can one city annually host a party with a guest list of more than a million people? The secret lies in the heart, soul, and extraordinary dedication of the people of this historic southern city. There are people like Sonny Bory and Artley Hanneman. They run the crew of Orpheus and have the daunting task of coordinating one of the largest and most extravagant parades in the city. Well, I'll, I'll probably see you in about an hour. I'll come over there and see what's going on, right? There's Mardi Gras Indian Chief Larry Bannock. He works alone all year to personally handcraft the elaborate beaded suit he'll wear for his parade on Fat Tuesday. This will get you anything you want. There's Dom Carlone, owner of Accent Annex, New Orleans' biggest and busiest retail beat operation. And Leslie Snadowski, a New Orleans resident and Mardi Gras partier who follows the parades each year to catch the best and the biggest beads. During this Bacchus parade, I caught lots of stuff. How many trucks do you have here right now? There's Blaine Kern, the master float builder, whose tireless staff works each year to build hundreds of Mardi Gras floats. It's got to be right or it doesn't roll. Where are the three people you say you had? And there's Willie Smith, an unlikely hero. His trash collecting team works round the clock for 12 straight days to pick up more than 1,000 tons of garbage. In just one week, the 12-day Mardi Gras festival begins and the people of New Orleans are working nonstop to stage one of the greatest shows on earth. I, I live it, I breathe it, uh, and I'd eat it if I could. 
No one knows the inside story of Mardi Gras better than Blaine Kern. As New Orleans premier float builder, he's credited with creating the look and feel of Mardi Gras. If you write Mr. Mardi Gras, I get the mail down here now, believe it or not. I've been doing this for 53 years, longer than that. What started as a humble business has grown into a family empire known as Kern Studios, a world-renowned float and prop building company. They build more than 70% of all Mardi Gras floats. I think I do enough floats to have gone around the world two or three times, put end to end. Really, honest to God, all these years, you can imagine. Once the primary designer and artist, Blaine now has a team of talented people who help execute his vision, drawing, painting, sculpting, and building his floats for Mardi Gras 365 days a year. I walk through the dens every day of my life. I go in the prop department. I don't like it, I love it. Because I see talented people executing what I wanted. Man, and it's, it's too much, it really is. Each year, Blaine and his team work closely with the parading clubs known as crews to help design and build their floats. The crews pay for their floats with the money they raise from members' annual dues, a fee that can range from a few hundred to a thousand dollars. Kern Studios also have rental floats for hire that roll several times throughout the Mardi Gras season. We build over 300 floats a year just for Mardi Gras, and some of these floats leave two and three times in one season. So I've got eight or nine hundred floats that are going through the streets of the city of New Orleans in a ten-day period. But there are parts of Mardi Gras most people never see, like the little-known but equally important Mardi Gras Indians. This 115-year-old tradition exists only in New Orleans' African-American neighborhoods. Well, Mardi Gras Indian is one of the best kept secrets about Mardi Gras. Larry Bannock is the chief of the Golden Star Hunters, one of almost two dozen Indian groups known as gangs that parade on Mardi Gras day through their local neighborhoods. As the chief, he's the official leader of his gang and the keeper and teacher of the Indian traditions. Larry's gang represents his community, the 17th Ward, also known as Girttown. I'm a big chief. To be a big chief is an honor and glory and respect of the people in your neighborhood or people around the city. For 28 years, Larry's been part of this unique tradition that historically pays homage to the Native Americans who sheltered runaway black slaves. Today, it's an important source of individual expression, creativity, and community pride. When we were slaves and we ran away, the Native Americans were the first people to accept us as men. You look at this house, you look on this side, it's crowded, congested, but everything in here is for Indian. Larry spends an entire year designing and hand sewing his Mardi Gras Indian costume. The finished suit will be covered with bead and rhinestone patches that represent Native American images and stories. Creating the costume and parading in it on Mardi Gras Day is a tradition known as masking. It's not just a bunch of men putting on Indian costumes parading down the street. I live it. Every piece you see on my suit, and every time I push that needle, that's, that's a stitch for the Mardi Gras Indian culture. With only two weeks to go before Mardi Gras Day, Larry's suit is far from finished. Each day and night he'll be sewing, hopefully to finish in time for Mardi Gras. It's like a passion. It's something you can't sit down and say in words, but you do it because you love it. Staging the parades takes incredible teamwork, and no one does it better than Sonny Borey and Ardley Hanneman, the captain and vice president of one of New Orleans' premier parade-throwing associations, the Crew of Orpheus. If you don't like Mardi Gras, don't get in this business, all right, because it's consuming, it's exhausting, uh, it's emotionally draining, 
and it's spiritually challenging, I can tell you. But if you're gonna do it, make sure that you're doing it with people who you respect, who you love, who you wanna work with, and who have the same broad vision that you do. That's the secret. With 27 of the most exquisite floats, 1,200 crew members, 25 marching bands, and celebrities from around the world clamoring to ride on their floats, Orpheus is New Orleans' most popular Mardi Gras event. There's never been anything the size of this parade on the streets before that has so many people so excited about coming every year. Orpheus was founded in 1994 by celebrated singer and New Orleans native Harry Connick Jr. After decades of elitism, he wanted to create a new tradition in New Orleans, a crew that was open to everyone, that anyone could join. To make his dream real, he hired his friend and former drama teacher, theater director Sonny Bory. I think he wanted a crew that was very inclusive. He wanted a crew that was both men and women, because most crews are either men or women. Uh, there are very few, if any, uh, at the time, that were both. He wanted a crew that was open to all races, all creeds, uh, uh, people of every color, uh, which is something that was not previously done in the city a, a number of years ago. We'll, we'll get it to him from here. We'll get it to him from here. As the captain of the crew, every season Sonny sets out to make Orpheus okay. Okay. the most show-stopping Mardi Gras event ever. Whenever I do something, I want it to be the absolute best that I can do. And, and I know that's what Harry feels about, about things. Have the prettiest floats, have the greatest bands, have the greatest entertainers at the, uh, the ball, the off the escapade. Uh, just make it a really showcase of a parade for the city of New Orleans. Together, Sonny and Ardley work almost year-round to stage the Orpheus Parade, from supervising the design of the floats, to coordinating costumes for the 1,200 riders to organizing the 4,500-person post-parade bash known as the Orpheus Capade Ball. And with only 13 days to go, they still have to coordinate millions of details. At this time of year, it's totally consuming, completely consuming. Sometimes, you know, 10 or 12 hours a day. And beginning the weekend before Mardi Gras, it's 24 hours a day. During the two weeks of the Mardi Gras festival, beads are everywhere. They're tossed from balconies, from floats. They're irresistible. They're the magical currency of Mardi Gras. It's a custom that dates back to 1871 when a masked rider dressed as Santa Claus threw gifts to the crowd. Today, beads are a multi-million dollar business and the most sought after Mardi Gras commodity. And no one knows beads better than Dom Carlone and Leslie Snadowski. He sells them, she catches them. It's so much thrill up there, throwing these things away. The people just craving, jumping up, waving their hands, begging for them, pleading for them, praying for them. Dom Carlone is the owner of Accent Annex, the biggest retail bead and trinket supplier in New Orleans. Each year he sells more than 72 million strands of beads to Mardi Gras partiers. I did a little search of what we did on Mardi Gras and uh, I figured it out that the beads that I bought and sold in my store at that time, this is like six years ago, that if we put them end to end, it would go one and a half times around the entire world. That's one hell of a necklace, I'll tell you. <laughs> Leslie Snodowski has a passion for Mardi Gras beads. She goes to the parades to catch as many throws as she can. She has thousands of necklaces stored in her home, all souvenirs from her years as an Orpheus crew member and as a Mardi Gras partier. I personally think it's bad luck to catch a bead and then throw it again. I think once you catch it, you know, that's the magic. You caught it, you know, and if you, th you know, throw it away again, you lose the magic. So that's why I keep it off. So why is everyone so crazy about beads? During Mardi Gras, normally sane people scream for them, grab for them, trade hugs and kisses for them, even flash for them. Beads have a huge street value during Mardi Gras. Depending on what you have, what kind of beads you have, you can get practically anything for them. I mean, and we're not just talking beads. <laughs> it's like an addiction, like if you're on dope or something. I want more, I want more, I want more. Throw me something. Please, throw me something. 
But not every bead that's tossed ends up around someone's neck. Beads and garbage fill the streets of New Orleans. And Willie Smith knows garbage. Yeah, follow him, you know. He's gonna take you and go with your own basement. Okay. He's the assistant superintendent for the New Orleans Department of Sanitation. For 29 years, he's worked to keep the city clean. Without Willie and his team, Mardi Gras would grind to a halt. It's a big job. You ever had a big party? This is the biggest party in the world. And uh, we have the responsibility to clean up after everybody's gone. During the 12 peak days of Mardi Gras festivities, there are as many as five parades a day that cover dozens of different routes. To prepare for Mardi Gras, Willie coordinates his workers, the equipment, and the grueling cleanup schedule. In the final days before the parades begin, he makes sure that all the equipment is in prime condition. Anything else wrong with this truck? By daylight, the next operation day, the city has to be back to normal. The average person, all they know is they're having fun. They get up the next morning to go to work, they say, what happened? They don't even know they had a parade to be so clean. This is one city that's got the monopoly on cleaning up after a big party. Each year, the success of Mardi Gras is measured in how much trash is collected. The more garbage, the more successful Mardi Gras. Willie is unfazed by the huge job that lies ahead. My work is my party, and we're here to provide a service for the city. It's the beginning of the 12 days of Mardi Gras festivities. The first parades are hitting the streets. the artists and craftspeople at Kern Studios are still working around the clock to meet the demands of their Mardi Gras clients. We were seven days a week from early in the morning until everything we can do is done. I give them a pep talk every year, right before the season starts. I say, well, come on, fellas, we're going to do it. And you know, we're responsible for it. It sounds corny, but they love it. We're, they really do. Each new float is commissioned and paid for by a parading crew. The cost can range from $25,000 to $850,000. Over the last several months, Kern and his clients have settled on a theme and design before they begin construction. The artist's drawing is quickly transformed into a wooden frame constructed on a steel chassis. From there, the wooden float is painted white and the design drawn on by hand, then painted. How many more of these you have to do? Uh, about 14 of them. 14? Yes. Next, the props are sculpted, painted, and then attached to the finished floats. This is the prop shop. We usually have about 10 people working in here full time, seven days a week working on props and figures. This is going to be used in the crew of Orpheus, and this is a shield, some wings, and when she's finished with it, it will get sent over to the Orpheus den and installed on the float. For the Leviathan, which is right behind me, this is of a giant sea serpent. This is for the crew of Orpheus. It's three sections long. It's about 150 feet in length, holds about 90 riders. The Leviathan is one of Kern's biggest and most extravagant creations. The price tag, $750,000. It has 55,000 fiber optic lights and is the first fiber optic float ever created for Mardi Gras. The biggest compliment I had was when that float rolled down the street and instead of people yelling, throw me something, they clapped. And I said, hey man, that's pretty good. <laughs> With new floats in the early stages of construction, it seems almost impossible that the work will all be done by deadline. Well, they have one week to get it done, and it will be done. In Girt Town, Chief Larry Bannock continues the tedious and time-consuming beadwork on his Indian suit. There's only 11 days before the parade of his gang, the Golden Star Hunters. Every year he worries that his suit won't be finished in time. There's not a lot of people that can sit down and have the patience to really 
bead one of these patches. When you're designing this suit, there's no plan. You start doing the patch and something come in your mind. Maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that. And you start beading the patch. Then you go to seeing the patch come to life. On Mardi Gras Day, he will finally show his suit to his community, dancing and singing with Indians from other gangs in a friendly competition to see who has created the most beautiful suit. When the 125 pound costume is complete, it will have cost Larry thousands of hours in labor and almost $6,000 in materials. He will have paid for it all personally, doing beating demonstrations and odd jobs as a carpenter and plumber. It's like Mays sang this song about my joy and my pain. It's my alpha, my omega. This is what I live for. The worst thing in the world is to clown or show off on me during this period. I'm under a lot of stress, but March the 7th, all this will pay off. Back in the city, in a nondescript warehouse called a den, a team of current employees and volunteers from the crew of Orpheus are working side by side to finish the Orpheus floats. They have only a week and a half before their parade rolls on Loon de Gras, the second to the last day of the Mardi Gras season. This is actually the captain's float. Um, it's the first float in the parade. It needs to be cleaned, repaired, repainted. Derek Franklin is the Orpheus design expert. He oversees the labor-intensive creation of the flowers and hand-applied gold leaf. They're the extra details that give the Orpheus floats an old-fashioned look. We want to give you uh, something magical to look at. We want to give you something extraordinary. You're going to look at those floats and go, wow, look at those floats, rather than just catching beads all the time. The work goes on and on to meet the deadline of parade day. I don't know if I'm going to ride on a float because when I get done with this I'll probably be too tired and I won't care about Mardi Gras. <laughs> with 10 more days of Mardi Gras parades to go, the beads are flying off the shelves in the New Orleans suburb of Metairie. Accent Annex's biggest retail store has hit its busiest week of the year. This is a small uh, portion of the beads that we have, very small portion. We have cases and cases that are waiting for us at our float. With individual shoppers spending as much as $2,000 on throws, Dom and his team work year-round to make the designs newer, bigger, and more attractive. The first question that the regular shoppers come in and say to every year is, what's new this year? And coming up with something new every year is a big challenge because how, can, how many different style beads can you have? This is the most popular bead in the whole city. And they're selling this bead for 57 cents for a dozen. These are some that you'll find a lot down Bourbon Street. These show some of the parts, you might say. But they're all covered up, you know. It's like they have the bikinis on or something like that. From big to bigger, to biggest. It's beat season in New Orleans. The Mardi Gras parade season has been going on for eight days. There are only four days left. The city is packed with a record two million people. The biggest parades are rolling and the French Quarter is about to bust. It's one big street party. Beads are flying, breasts are flashing. And for Willie Smith, the trash is building up. The bigger the crowds and parades, the more garbage litters the streets. Shirley not with me. Shirley has been DDD. Willie and the sanitation department are working overtime to keep the city functioning. They still have 15 parades to clean up after. 18 to 24 hours. We out there working, getting the city back. As every night, the city be back in operation by the next morning. Each morning, the sanitation department workers congregate at City Yard. They drive in a long convoy to the start of the first parade of the day. They've got trucks, vans, and a police escort. NOPD, during Mardi Gras season, uh, assign officers to, to assist us. Without the police, it will be an uh, impossible job, because without them, 
the way the traffic be during Mardi Gras season, no way we could get through that traffic and arrive on time. Q20, all the operators, fire up, we're getting ready to move. Once a parade begins to roll, so does the sanitation department. They have the flusher. Uh, he's wetting, washing everything to the side where the mechanical sweepers can uh, sweep it up. They sweep up much as they can. Then you have the truck that behind them that they dump in. Then you got your, your laborers in the background, you know. They, they sweep and they knocking the sidewalks off. On the up tail end of the parade, you have the tie man, you have the tow truck. But we have to bring everything with us. We can't call in. So when you have a flat or you have a breakdown, pick it up, move it out the way, and we continue. The sanitation department always gets a warm reception from the crowds. The people know when they see sanitation, that's the end of the parade. They're cheering and the kids are running and how because they're so excited. They see these water trucks coming down the street shooting water. It's just like them watching another parade. Lundi Gras. The second to the last day of Mardi Gras is finally here. After 10 parade and party filled days, New Orleans is slowly waking up. Tonight, Sonny Bory and Ardley Hanneman will present the crew of Orpheus to the city and the world. By 9 a.m., final preparations for the Orpheus parade are underway at the convention center. Crew members begin arriving to load their throws onto the floats. I think figure we should just load up all the um, the bags right over here and the boxes behind. Is that cool? Thanks. Let's stick at our little spot. Inside, Sonny and Arlie coordinate the final details. I'm going to find this man because he's screwing this whole thing up. I'll deal with membership questions, with ball ticket questions, making sure that celebrities are going to get there on time. We have a press conference that we have to get set up for. Sonny's involved with making sure that every float's costumes are where they should be, or that um, the floats are in position so we can get on them and start on time. It's a feeling of excitement, it's a feeling of anticipation, it's a feeling of nervousness as well to make sure everything goes right. 10 a.m. The floats are supposed to have arrived, but the street is empty. By noon, they're still nowhere to be seen. Crew members line the sidewalks, waiting in the hot sun. We're waiting for the floats. They were supposed to be here at 11. And, oh, really, and uh, so everything is a little loose. No one really knows where we're supposed to be. <laughs> Finally, the line of floats lumbers down Convention Center Boulevard. As they roll to a stop, the riders begin to load their beads. Then they go in and they start dressing and get their costume. And then that's when the transformation starts. That's when the, you know, the make-believe begins. Meanwhile, upstairs, the press conference starts. The celebrities riding in the Orpheus Parade are introduced. First, actress Cameron Mannheim, the Emmy-winning star of TV's The Practice. Well, I don't know if you heard, but I am the Big Easy, so. <laughs> then, movie star and comedian Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> yeah. oh, God, after that, I, I'd invite you to have sex now. <laughs> It's 2 o'clock, and master float builder Blaine Kern arrives at the convention center. He'll ride at the front of the Orpheus Parade, monitoring any breakdowns, flat tires, and technical problems. Right now today, working for me are dozens of individuals who've got big jobs, and they take off from their work and are helping me today just stage and put on this parade. There's blacksmiths in here, 
and electricians and guys of uh, sculptures are out here touching up the last minute. Somebody needs a party. Somebody, something's broken, we fix it. Blaine checks on the lineup of the floats to make sure everything is running smoothly. Right. Everything under control there? Everything's great right now. Yeah, okay. Well, as long as you guys are at the end of the parade, hey, I'll feel good. We You're damn right. Mr. Mardi Gras is greeted by dozens of fans and well-wishers as he moves along the lineup. Y'all ready? <laughs> Let's go! All right, All right. Let's go! Let's <laughs> go! You know, I'm like a kid about it yet. Uh, I just, I don't know, I love it. I can't describe it. I'm looking and I'm seeing, now what can I do next year to change and to do it better? Not sure we have enough. We might have to ride the float there. It's almost four o'clock. The deadline for moving the floats and all the riders from the convention center to the staging area, a location several miles away, where the floats will line up for the start of the parade. With two million people waiting to watch the Orpheus parade, Sonny and Arley are determined to stay on schedule. We have to be at the starting point at a certain time because there's a parade before us and there's a parade behind us. So we've got to roll on time. Only minutes left. Costumes are adjusted. Everyone gets on their floats and hangs up the last of their throws. And the questions keep coming. What don't they understand about the word no? That's what I want. That, right. That's my, that, no. Finally, and on schedule, the Orpheus floats leave for the parade starting line. Sonny waves off each one. Do you know how to have their costumes? This might sound strange, but probably one of my, my favorite moments of the parade is going to the parade, going to the lineup of the parade before it starts. Not that I do not enjoy the parade itself, because I do tremendously, but the anticipation going there is fun. Yes. Let's stay right, okay? Once the last float is gone, it's a race for Sonny and Arley to get to the staging area before the floats arrive. Mr. Mardi Gras also speeds through the streets to beat the floats to the lineup. And we get up there a little early, have one or two cold beers to relax us. Very important, very important. And then we don't allow drinking in the parade, because we've already done it. <laughs> the staging area is thick with people. Sonny and Ardley handle the last minute details. Performers prepare, the police keep order. And Blaine greets his many friends and admirers. Six PM. After months of planning, preparation, and anticipation, the Orpheus Parade is ready to roll. Some anxiety, some um, some real emotion, you know, I mean it's all built up. It's welling up and, and you get ready to roll. You really kind of want to cry. Um, I've got my two sons with me. The starting on time, the fans are playing. It's, it's really building right now. The police lead the way, followed by the motorcycle brigades, flambeau carriers, stilt walkers, and then the floats appear. There's the captain's float. The Trojan horse. The celebrity floats. The Smoky Mary. The Leviathan. There's stilt walkers, marching bands, and music. What makes you really feel so good is that you are a little part of the most spectacular parade in Mardi Gras. You know, you look out there, the people are 20, 25 deep. You know, that just makes you feel great that you have little bit to do with this thing, with this whole spectacular parade. It's fabulous. 
As the parade rolls, Blaine Kern is in his element. The crowd cheers for Mr. Mardi Gras. Oh, God almighty, you can't put it into words. It's wonderful, sure, wonderful feeling. For seven miles, Orpheus weaves through the city. As each float passes, cheers erupt and the riders shower the crowd with beads. It's a wonderful give and take between the crowd and the float that only happens here. I don't know why anybody goes to a parade where they don't throw beads. Why would you go to that? You know, it's that interaction with Mardi Gras is so um, community oriented, so interactive. You know, it's, it's not the greatest free show on earth, it's the greatest uh, participatory show on earth because they're throwing and you're catching and, and you're dancing with bands if you're on the street or if you're on the float. It's, it's totally consuming for everybody who's there. You know, and you, you'll ride through two million people and, and you won't see anybody who's not smiling. As the parade rolls into the convention center for the grand finale of the evening, the Orpheus Capade Ball, Lundi Gras draws to a close. Sonny says that Orpheus is his child. I think Orpheus is my protege. Orpheus is, is, is my joy, it's my relaxation, it's, uh, it's my creativity, it's, uh, it's my gift to everybody else. It's Fat Tuesday, the last day of Mardi Gras festivities and the day from which the season takes its name. The party comes to an end at midnight. The city is in a frenzy. Downtown, there's the noise of two million people. But uptown, in the 17th Ward, Mardi Gras Indian Chief Larry Bannock is still hard at work on his beaded suit. A group of friends gather around to help. Larry's also joined by Margie Perkins, the queen of his gang of Mardi Gras Indians, the Golden Star Hunters. Her suit is also unfinished. Together, they're racing against time. Okay. When you take it up right there, be just right. Okay. When you finally finish this suit, you finish the last bead, the last stone. You go in the room there and you get on your knees. You pray and you thank God for letting you make it. As the work continues inside, Larry steps outside to look for his spy boy and flag boy, two gang members who, together with Larry and his queen, will make up his Mardi Gras Indian gang. With an unfinished costume and half his gang missing, for Larry Bannock, there may be no Mardi Gras parade. There shouldn't be no traffic from the airport to here. Huh? No, not that much. It was, uh, it was pretty empty. Friends, family, and neighbors begin to arrive. They are Larry's second liners, who follow along behind the gang, dancing, singing, and chanting the traditional songs and rhythms of the Mardi Gras Indians. Meanwhile, Spy Boy and Flag Boy are still nowhere to be seen. How long y'all gonna be? Finally, from far down the street, Flag Boy appears, and he's looking for his chief. Then, from the opposite side of the neighborhood, Spy Boy arrives. The gang is all there, and the crowd is excited to dress their chief. It's like a gladiator. Your gang or your people dressing you for battle. It's like when they get through dressing me and I'm walking down Olive Street and it's like them nights you couldn't sleep, them days you was behind, all of that 
it's paid for when somebody tell you, boy, you're pretty. When you dress, then you don't thank the people that put you there. You get your tambourine. You twirl it and you hit it. Then you go, Mare, 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 Kuri Fayo. That's when your spy boy and all your enemies start jumping and shouting. It's the prayer that you pray to God. You're asking God to watch over you and bring you back home safe. Then you go, Mare, Mare, Kuri Fayo. Inion Re. That's when all your people start following me. We are the engine. Larry and the Golden Star Hunters begin their procession. Spy Boy is out in front looking for rival Indians. If he spots a gang, he'll signal back down the line to the chief. Flag Boy roams the middle, where he stops all traffic and makes sure the neighborhood knows who's coming through. As they wind their way through the neighborhood, the community is swept along into the music and dance, forming a second line behind the gang. Where else in the world can you go but in New Orleans and pick up a can, a cold drink bottle, and make a sound? It's something that's done from the street. Finally, the Golden Star Hunters meet a rival, an Apache spy boy. It's like you're dancing into battle. The confrontation begins. It's a ritualized performance where each gang member, starting with spy boy, must do battle using dance and showmanship. You go to showing him the, the different parts of your suit, you're raising up your shirt, you're looking at your apron. You got all this stuff, your shoes, everything is decorated on you. There's no fighting, no violence to the standoff. The object is to see who's the prettiest Indian, the one who in the end gets to pass by in victory and good spirit. Then at the end, you don't walk by him. You shake his hand and you step to the side. This time, Larry and his gang members have outshone their rival. It's been a year of painstaking work, but all worth it. Larry and his gang head off into the crowd in search of more Indians to confront and more battles to win. You keep saying, I'm going to retire, but you be saying, look, I'm going to do one more year. I don't think I ever retire. I think I could be a deacon in church and the Indians be passing. I'd put my hand up, excuse me, let me go <laughs> see the idiots. I'm going to be a Mardi Gras Indian until the day I die. Across town, Mardi Gras Day is in full swing. Throughout the city, parades are rolling. It's the ultimate day to catch beads for bead collector Leslie Snodowski. So a lot of people come here just to get, you know, silly and stupid and drunk. But for me, I love the parades. And then, of course, I love Fat Tuesday itself. I mean, it's just, just the mood. I mean, everyone's just crazy, and it's totally loud. Everyone is sort of saying to themselves, I'll be nuts, you'll be nuts, and we'll all laugh about it later. Every, everything goes um, on Fat Tuesday. The crew of Zulu is the first parade of the day. Wild and raucous, the crowd loves them and loves their hand-painted coconuts. This is what you come to Mardi Gras for, especially Zulu. It's the real deal, authentic Zulu coconut. coconut! Next comes Rex, the official king of Mardi Gras. As one of the oldest parading crews, they represent the old time traditions and draw some of the biggest crowds. Leslie's out front, watching the parade and catching the treasured Rex throws. This is our slow The trick to catching beads during the Mardi Gras parade is to establish eye contact with the rider. That's, that's really it, because the rider is seeing hundreds of thousands of people, 
and you know how do you stand out so it's either um, you hold up a sign or something you wear a funny costume but that helps but it's really the eye contact if they see you then you give them a good grin or a smile or you act all crazy wave your hands then they're more likely to throw to you if it's your first Mardi Gras even your second you, know, you tend to pick stuff up off the ground but I'm sort of a Mardi Gras veteran <laughs> and now if I don't catch it in midair there's sort of there's no challenge when Rex is over Leslie moves to the French Quarter, where every balcony is jammed with bead tossers. For the moment, beads are the one thing everybody wants. The moment the, the, the clock strikes midnight tonight, and it's and Fat Tuesday it turns into Ash Wednesday, they're useless. I mean, I could dump all these on the ground, these wonderful beads that I worked so hard to collect on the ground. Most people just walk on by. They're just not worth anything after Fat Tuesday. By 7 o'clock, Mardi Gras Day is drawing to a close. The parades are over for another year, and throughout the city, the celebration is winding down. But in the French Quarter, the party rages on. Beads are flying off balconies, the streets are jammed. People have been drinking for days. Everyone wants the party to continue. But by 11.30, the police and sanitation departments are lining up in the French Quarter for the final parade of the year. It's time for their midnight ride down Bourbon Street when they'll clear the streets of revelers and begin the final cleanup. It's the annual ritual that has come to symbolize the official end to Mardi Gras. It's the thrill of everybody that the end is coming. You know, we have the police department, the EMS, the emergency, we have the posse from the police department. We have the uh, squad cars. Everybody, they line up at the foot of Canal and Bourbon. Through the thick sea of people, the police and sanitation departments begin their march. They start with the sirens and the horses going down. We line up behind them with our water wagon. We have the sweepers, we have the dump truck. Then you have your garbage trucks coming behind us. Nobody want to stop partying. As, the, as we go through, the crowd closed back in like that, you know? And you say, this is a madhouse. Oh, you, that's all you're saying to yourself. These people here, they, they mad. They don't understand, it's over. You know, they don't want to stop. Like I said, they still there. The crowd cheers the midnight spectacle. The wail of the sirens, roar of the trash trucks, and hissing spray of the water wagons. After 12 straight days, 2 million people, and a record 1,459 tons of garbage, Mardi Gras is finally over. But, believe it or not, within days, it will start all over again. Wednesday morning, we start planning next year's parade. It's been more than just a parade, more than just a party. For 12 magical days, it's the freedom to cut loose, to be crazy, to be part of the ritual that celebrates life to the limit. It's a gift from the people of New Orleans to themselves and to the world. This is Mardi Gras. When I go out to the Mardi Gras parades, I ride at the head of some of the big parades, and my gosh, I see everybody they're not like this, they're like this. They're grinning and laughing and they're happy and having fun. Mardi Gras night, I just hope and pray that the cramps, the aches and the pains, I mean, it's like you'd be sitting up here crying. <laughs> but you wake up to Wednesday morning, back at this table. Everybody want to party in the Big Easy. This is the big party. They might have Mardi Gras or other areas, but it's nothing like the Big Easy. It is New Orleans, and if you love New Orleans, you've got to love Mardi Gras. It's what sets us apart from any other city in the world.